uncommitted at this point, I think has something like what, 10 delegates? I mean, is that enough for them to, you know, be uncommitted to be your nominee? No. But is it enough to say, hey, you know, maybe maybe we should be listening to the folks that are frankly in this coalition that they're going to need while they may still be uh, planning to vote for, you know, a Biden-Harris ticket, do have some concerns. Hello and welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Miller. Uh, We have a great guest today, Aaron Haynes, editor-at-large of the 19th. We are going to be talking about the Super Tuesday results. We're going to be talking about her journalism and whether Joe Biden has any problems to be concerned about with black voters in particular, other voters of color. Uh, But before we get to Aaron, we have a special surprise for you. Um, There was an article that many of you saw in the New York Times, the failing New York Times this week, talked about how Joe Biden's superfans think the rest of America has lost its mind. They write, bewildered by tepid enthusiasm for a president they see as transformative, these voters occupy a lonely place in the U.S. politics. Quote, I feel like I'm the only one says one of the voters, and, and we're just really lucky, uh, thanks to great production work. We're able to score for this podcast one of these voters, one of these Joe Biden super fans who feels disenfranchised, and so I just want to welcome to the podcast John from North Jersey. John, how are you? Hey, T, what's up? <laughs> wow, it's really, boy, it's great to have you here. So do you, do you share the view of these voters uh, You know, the, in the Times? Do you feel marginalized? disenfranchised by the media that your voice isn't being heard right now as a, as a Joe Biden super fan? You know, I, I don't read the times as much, you know, to be on, to be honest, which is the, the times they got these pointy heads at the times. Oh, all recessions yeah. coming this month. No, all recessions coming that month. I'm Russ Douthit. Let me tell you about Nietzsche and you know, I'm more of a post guy. All right. I'm a post guy. And I read that. Hey. It's all the, the, the DeSantis talk. Like, you know, that me... And look, God love him. He's one of my people. But, uh, you know, that's not my guy. I look at Joe. Joe, our guy, old Joe, the old guy. He's yeah. been pretty good, man. He's been pretty good. Especially for an Irish. Yeah, you were with him the whole time. You were with him the primary last time around. And you just know, a long time, little, Joe Biden. I was a little... I, you know, look, I'm not going to lie to you. I, I liked a lot of some of the stuff the Bernie guy was talking about. I like, uh, you know, sticking up for the workers and maybe taxing more of the billionaires. But Joe came in, you know, look, I got my grandmother. She's 89 years old. God love her. Maria Francesca Graziana. And she, I, mean, I was worried sick all through COVID. Joe comes in, the vaccines get out, boom, boom COVID's gone. You know, I don't worry about my grandma moms now. It's, yeah. you know, look at I don't know if you paid much attention to macroeconomics, Tim. I do. Do, do, you, do you guys do. pay yeah, attention we had a, to that? We had an economist on yesterday. Yeah, we do. Yeah. You know, median household wealth in America of 37%. Did you know hmm. that? 37%. But uh, people don't get it through their minds, right? So I was over at Sergio's with my boys Tony and Anthony the other day. And we went in there. We went to get some gabagool. And you know, Tony's like, oh, the price of gabagool is up 17%. And I said, sure. Sure it is. But, you know, you fakakta, you got to understand, your wages are up 20%. That means you are doing better, and the real price of that gabagool is actually going down for you. But people don't realize this. That's good, the gabagool index. So overall for you, Joe Biden, just A, A, you're giving him an A, big super fan of of Joe Biden, no issues. I think he's been great. He's been great. He's a little old, but you know what? You know who else was old? Don Corleone, he still got it done because he was wise and he knew when to go to the mattresses. Well, I appreciate that. We had Dakota Galbin, age 28, is in the New York Times. We tried to get Dakota, wasn't available. But, uh, you know, uh, here's what he said. I feel like I'm the only one. Does anybody care that I exist <laughs> about, about his Joe Biden support? Dakota is a great picture of him in the Times with a, T- with a Joe Biden seen. cutout. And I just think, John, you and Dakota, you guys are out there. And we wanted to make sure you were seen. And I appreciate, I appreciate it. And for those who haven't yet figured it out, that's Bulwark editor Jonathan V. Last, our resident Joe Biden super fan. Thank you so much for being with us, Jonathan. So great to be with you, Tim. Thanks. First time we'll on the show. We'll be back on the First next level. If you, guys want, if you guys want more JVL and his regular voice, 
Check us out over on the next level every Wednesday. Me, JVL, and Sarah. Uh, We'll be talking Super Tuesday. Up next, the great Aaron Haynes. Stick around for that. This morning, 1,155 days after Donald Trump incited a deadly riot on the United States Capitol in an attempt to overturn a free and fair election, he stands alone in the GOP primary en route to a third presidential nomination that he's won in a landslide with no modern precedent. His final opponent, Nikki Haley, suspended her campaign this morning during remarks in South Carolina. I have always been a conservative Republican and always supported the Republican nominee. But on this question, as she did on so many others, Margaret Thatcher provided some good advice when she said, quote, never just follow the crowd, always make up your own mind. It is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those in our party and beyond it who did not support him. And I hope he does that. At its best, politics is about bringing people into your cause, not turning them away. And our conservative cause badly needs more people. This is now his time for choosing. I end my campaign with the same words I began it from the book of Joshua. I direct them to all Americans, but especially to so many of the women and girls out there who put their faith in our campaign. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For God will be with you wherever you go. Woof. Uh, That is a depressing state of play. But I'm delighted to have my friend, my former co-guest host, Aaron Haynes, to break it all down. Aaron is the editor-at-large of the 19th News, a nonprofit newsroom reporting on gender and politics. It's the subject of a new documentary on PBS called Breaking the News. She's also the host of the Amendment podcast. Aaron, thanks for coming on. Wow. Uh, Thanks for being here because you've been everywhere these last few hours, my friend. Well, you know, this is our moment, the former Republicans, to talk about the state of play, to shame people, to wave our, wag our finger. And I'm wagging my finger. I'm wagging my finger. He my is. former colleagues should feel deep shame this morning that they that their opposition to this guy was so limp that he won every state except Vermont and Washington D.C. But uh, anyway, what was your what are your takeaways from uh, from our Super Tuesday last night, or not so Super Tuesday? Well, I mean, yeah, not not so Super Tuesday, right? I mean, I think that uh, this was kind of the outcome we expected, complete with uh, Nikki Haley uh, bowing out after Super Tuesday. I mean, she didn't really have any campaign events scheduled after Super Tuesday, uh, which is always a tell, right? Um, and she said, you know, she was going to stay in it at least until Super Tuesday and, and for as long as she could remain competitive. Well, clearly uh, not competitive uh, based on what we saw uh, coming out of last night. And, and so the question really is, what does she do now? Right. What is, what, you know, she is somebody that went a little harder, uh, towards the end, uh, after former president Trump is, is she going to stick to that or, or, or does she end up falling in line with, with the rest of her kind of fallen comrades, uh, here, uh, that were on the campaign trail. And now, uh, you know, where she finds herself on the other side of that, are we going to see her on a campaign stage with, with uh, Donald Trump uh, sometime in the near future as he continues his march to the nomination? Are we in the darkest timeline? That's your question for me, Aaron. Like, do we really, <laughs> do I have to, do I have to is she going to really, do, I mean, I guess all these other people folded, right? I, I don't really know what reason there is to have any hope that she's not going to, but you do, it, I, I do think it's meaningful. I mean, you look at last night and my main takeaway is, of, of the presidential, I want to get. There was a lot of interesting stuff, kind of down the ballot. I want to talk to you about, but um, the at the presidential level, it's like it's a pretty rump group at this point. I mean, she's getting nineteen percent in some of these states, seventeen percent. It was uh, you know above twenty in North Carolina, yeah, uh, you know above thirty in Virginia. But it's a small group. But the people that voted for her really don't like Donald Trump. If you look at the exit polls, like don't like they the, fervently dislike him. And so what she does could potentially nudge those people you know, one way or the other. True. I mean, it, it, but but n- nudge them where, right? Nudge them to the couch or nudge them to Joe Biden, who she has also kind of been hitting uh, yeah. in, in these last few weeks. So, I mean, that, that really is kind of unclear. Like what, what is the, what is the role that, that, that she's planning to play? Uh, I mean, we uh, certainly haven't seen like a Chris Christie, for example, you know, he drops out, he's, he's not endorsing Trump, but where is he? You know, he just kind of, 
went away after that. Tim Scott, we have seen, you know, clearly, uh, you know, angling for the veep stakes here. I don't think Nikki Haley is angling for a veep stakes, but hey, stranger things have happened. I'm not in the prediction business here. So, uh, you know, who knows? Yeah, I'm I'm interested in your take on um, one race in particular down the ballot, our friend Mark Robinson, yeah. North Carolina, um, Lieutenant Governor uh, of North Carolina, the, um, uh, you know, has a, just a, a range of conspiracies that are kind of too insane to list almost, uh, thinks Beyonce is demonic, is worried about the lizard people, doesn't think that school shootings are real, called David Hogg a prostitute. Um, which uh, is not that funny, um, and uh, thinks gay people, not not big on gay people, filth, cow dung, uh, end of society type yeah. stuff over, over gays. I mean, we could go down the list. Not a big fan of Jews either, Holocaust denial. Um, I, I mean, well, I just like you. you this, I, I'm just asking you to set, maybe give me a psychological assessment of, of, this, of this man yeah. and of the yeah. party that not, is nominating not, him. Not my ministry either. But I mean, look to your point. Like we have a Republican who says, you know, God formed him to fight LGBTQ plus acceptance to, to fight that. This is who just won the North Carolina GOP primary. Um, he also is an, oppo- an opponent of abortion, which we know is on the ballot headed into November. So, I mean, you know, he is, uh, you know, looking to, to challenge uh, this Democratic attorney general uh, in November. Uh, North Carolina currently has a Democratic governor who has been kind of this firewall on the Republican supermajority in the state legislature and, and has blocked a lot of GOP priorities in North Carolina. So, I mean, this guy, I, you know, I, again, not doing a psychological assessment at all, uh, but he is a pastor. He has this kind of long history of making these anti-LGBTQ plus comments from the pulpit. Um and, you know, he said, you know, transgender women are going to be arrested if they use a, a, a women's bathroom. So, I mean, this is somebody who is, is absolutely leaning into the culture wars, but it paid off in this primary. So I don't know, you know, I don't know what that says about where North Carolina um, Republican voters are headed into November and, and what that says for uh, maybe where the Republican Party is. I mean, this is somebody who's probably going to be on a uh, con- Republican convention stage, because remember, Donald Trump just crowned him Martin Luther King on steroids, whatever that means. Try putting that in AI and see what comes out. I'd love to. to Martin Luther King times two Martin Luther King on steroids. I don't know if that was a weight. Do you you think that was Donald Trump making a subtle joke about his weight or about the content of his character? um, 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 (laughs) Character on steroids. Maybe. I don't know. Got it. Um, Yeah, I do. I know what it says about the Republican Party. It's, um, you know, there's the Thomas Massey line that I always fall back on. Um, which is he's a Tea Party guy in the House who, who said that he always thought that the, that Republican voters wanted were voting for the most conservative candidate in the race or the most anti small government candidate in the race. But um, what it has turned out to be is that they are voting for the craziest son of a bitch in the race, and I mean that's true in this across the across the country last night. I mean in Texas, you know um, Ken Paxton gets impeached. Um, by you know the House Republicans and then and then acquitted by Senate Republicans sounds familiar in the state and then goes on a revenge tour and, and takes out a you know a lot of the mainstream Republicans last night. Dinesh D'Souza's son-in-law is a thirty-year-old mar- movie marketer. If you want to call it movie marketing, it was a two thousand mules, the conspiracy movie about the twenty twenty election. Uh, he wins a primary last night over. Uh, you know, I mean, people that actually have real jobs. I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know how mainstream their beliefs are, but it was, you know, a mayor and a former congressional chief of staff mm-hmm. against a child that ran, that marketed a conspiracy movie. So I, I just think that just like it is consistent across the board. Um, this is the kind of folks that that the party's putting up. I mean, yeah. I, I wish we could spin any other way. Okay, I want your take on what's happened on the other side. Um, you know, there are kind of two points of view about this uncommitted vote. Um, I look at Minnesota and I get a little alarmed. I just, I'll be honest, Joe Biden has 70% in Minnesota last night, uh, 20, about 19 for uncommitted Dean Phillips. It's his home state, but he gets 8%. Um, uh, what, what's your assessment? There's, there also are folks out there. I think rightly, a uh, uh, bill sure, um, pointed out that the, the Obama 2012 share of the vote is not really meaningfully different from, from Biden. A lot of people were uncommitted and, and, and supported protest candidates in 2012, um, which side of that do you fall on? Like this is something that 
that Joe Biden should be really concerned about, or this is kind of a, a pretty standard Democratic protest vote? I mean, I, uh, yes. Yes, <laughs> but, but, both. You, you know what I mean? I mean, like, you know, I, I think it is something that uh, the administration uh, is paying attention to. I mean, uncommitted at this point, I think, has something like, what, 10 delegates? I mean, is that enough for them to, you know, be uncommitted to be your nominee? No. But is it enough to say, hey, you know, maybe maybe we should be listening to the folks that are, frankly, in this coalition that they're going to need to win in November uh, again? Uh, they're going to need to put, put those put those folks together. And right now, some of those folks, are, are you know, while they may still be uh, planning to vote for, you know, a Biden-Harris ticket, do have some concerns and, and, and given that voter enthusiasm is kind of where it is, that puts it, you know, it's, 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 um, you know, it's a buyer's market right, right now for them for, in terms for, in terms of like them really kind of trying to set an agenda of things that they would like to see this administration doing. So it's not really just about, uh, them hitting the campaign trail and telling them, you know, this is what we're going to do for you. I, I, I think that they, uh, are in a posi- position where they really do have to listen uh, to, to voters this year if they want them not just turning out, but also knocking the doors, making the phone calls. I mean, that is also part of the voter enthusiasm part, right, to, to get people to actually show up for them, because we know this election is going to be close again. Um, so much of it feels familiar, but this is absolutely not a status quo year. Uh, and so even though you do see kind of some of those familiar dynamics in terms of of the uncommitted vote that kind of crops up every cycle, why they are uncommitted or why they are kind of being, um, I don't know, these kind of conscientious objectors for lack of a better word on, on some issues uh, that, that is worth paying attention to. And that, that is worth, uh, uh, worth them, them responding to. And I think you are starting to see some of that. I particularly want to dig in on, and you know, this is obviously happening across the board. It's happening with um, young college grads um on in the democratic coalition uh but you know the thing that really jumps out you know from the recent polls the new york times poll um and again some of this is noisy we're looking at cross tabs but uh, but there's a consistent trend in cross tabs that um voters of color hispanic voters and black voters in particular are are going away from biden at rates higher than they did at 2020 um what do you th- what do you think about that? Is that noise? It's early. The the choice hasn't congealed. Is that Gaza? Is is there something else happening? Is it culture war? Um, is that we shouldn't be getting getting our underwear minerated about this in March before November? Like wh- you know, how, when you're out there talking to to voters, black voters, Hispanic voters, like what what's your sense for it? Yeah, I mean, again, it is kind of an all all of the uh, above. Uh, these are voters that are pragmatic. Number one, let me just say that. I mean, that was certainly what we saw in twenty twenty. Uh, you know, they are absolutely paying attention to what's happening in this country. Absolutely care about what's happening uh, in this democracy. And and you know, especially you know, a lot of the black voters that I talk to. This is as much as it is about either one of these candidates and certainly black voters we know overwhelmingly voted for Joe Biden and and, and rejected Trump. And, and I suspect that that sure. will be the, the case again uh, this fall. But um, their vote is, is, is as much about their own power as it is about trying to give somebody else power. So, uh, you know, if that is the message that is being reinforced for them. Uh, I do think that you, uh, again, black voters are going to do what black voters, uh, you know, typically do uh, in uh, in elections. Uh, abortion being on the ballot, uh, reproductive right. I mean, rights in general being on the ballot is something that I think uh, it will continue to resonate with with, uh, you know, voters of color. And it is early. I mean, you know, these are folks that are working, that are looking at the price of groceries right now. They're not looking necessarily at, uh, you know, what happened uh, coming out of Super Tuesday. So. You know, I think as we get we get closer, as it as it you know becomes time to vote, uh, I do think uh, you're, you're going to see more chatter, more activity, and and frankly, uh, these folks showing up uh, at the ballot box. Yeah, the groceries thing is a good point. I, so again, this is just it. Is, I feel like out of my comfort zone on this one. Just trying to you know, I'm, I feel like I, I really do feel like a green room pundit trying to you know divine <laughs> the will of, of of folks that like I just. It's not my people. You know, I'm brought in to talk about what, why these fucking crazy Republicans are doing what they're doing. I was paid to try to figure that out for a couple decades. So I, I feel comfortable analyzing their intentions. But I, I just, it could, like, right? I like this. The answer could be as simply, simply that, you know, because it is working class, right? It's non college. 
black voters and Hispanic voters that Trump is doing worse with. And so you just look at that and it's like, well, I don't know, maybe it's Gaza, right? Maybe it's a feeling of, of, you know, allyship, that, that question, maybe it's culture war stuff. Maybe culture war stuff is working for Republicans, but like also maybe the simple Occam's razor answer is like, people are still annoyed about grocery prices. Like inflation did disrupt life and and people are just expressing to pollsters like that frustration right and yeah. they're like out with the you know like we're just i'm just gonna throw it out and again you're you you're right to point out like black voters are obviously gonna vote for for biden in big margins but the question is like how big those margins are That's is gonna exactly be pretty right. damn important you know it, it's gonna it's gonna be hugely important i mean like like uh literally kind of the the persuasion strategy right now uh for folks is 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 not just a, you know, in terms of of voting for a candidate, it, it, you're persuading people to get off the couch, right, and not stay home on election day. And so I think that that is a real concern uh, for people who may be looking at their circumstances, thinking, you know, what is the point? It, it's not that they don't care about their country, but they they need to understand how their vote is going to matter this year. And while people like you and me who get paid to think about this for a living are very clear on why, yeah. you know, it is important to vote. Um, you know, that's not always um, the case for some folks whose circumstances do not change no matter who the president is on the ground. Their reality um, is not, you know, they don't feel like their reality is, is impacted by that, even though uh, it, it is. You know, what? I, I hear you on that. And, and look, just, I, I was just pulling this up. I mean, Biden wins black, black non-Hispanic voters by eighty-four, by ninety-two to eight. So it's like again, that the problem is that that gives Trump a lot of room to grow, right? I mean, even if you if you're only even if you're only winning thirteen percent of the vote, um, you know that that still is cutting the margins by five. The other question I have for you on this point is when you're talking about this, the stakes question, and and you and I follow this stuff closely. I, I got a little nervous. I have to admit, there's a New Yorker profile. Evan Osnos is interviewing all the Biden folks. And, and Mike Donilon is in there, one of Biden's closest advisors, saying this election is going to be about democracy. Democracy is going to be on the ballot. I'm for that. I'm for that. We're going to talk about democracy a fucking shit ton on this podcast. But like for the voters, we're talking for, for you know, for folks that are worried about grocery prices. Does that spook you a little bit? Like just thinking about that, that the, the, there's going to be too much of a focus on on democracy, on you know, these sort of esoteric things instead of practical things no. that might matter. No, no, uh, and only because I mean, look, first of all, because I I believe there's no such thing as a single issue voter, right? So you know, for people who are concerned about democracy, they can also be concerned about the economy. They can also be concerned about reproductive rights. They can also be concerned about gun violence. They can also be concerned about LGBTQ plus issues. They can be, you know, we contain multitudes as voters, right? And I yeah. and I think that we need to remember that uh, that 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 there can be a number of factors that contribute to a person uh, actually getting up uh, and, and going to cast their ballot. So we, you know, we should absolutely remember that. Also, like all of these things kind of fit under this umbrella of, um, you know, what we mean when we ask people, uh, do you think this country is headed in the right direction? And they say no. Right. right. So, you know, I think it, it, it is kind of on us to kind of understand unpack that with with them and understand you know what do you mean by that what do you you know what do you mean republican voter when you when you say that what do you mean you know democratic voter in a, in you know south georgia when you say that that things are going in the wrong direction for you uh and how is that going to motivate what you decide to do in november because again like i feel like we focus so much on people's feelings when again like okay we've heard how you feel how is that motivating what you were actually going to do in november I got a lot of feelings, you know. We, so we, big feelings. Big I got a feelings. lot of feelings, so maybe that's why. Um, mm -hmm. You wrote recently about this. The, um, you know, what you, you wrote uh, why uh, aren't the presidential candidates in either party better at talking about race um, uh, for the nineteenth? And I just, I do, I just am wondering, you know, if if President Biden calls you tomorrow, and is like, hey, I want to have coffee. Um, you know, I was, I was watching morning Joe and they're talking about the cross tabs of this New York times poll. And I don't know why I'm only up by 60 with black voters. Uh, you know, the, the race issue get thrust into the election in 2020. I guess just to be honest, because of George Floyd, right? Like it got thrust into the middle of the general election. And, and so we, you know, we don't know what the future holds. We don't know what issues will rise to the fore, what will happen. But so, uh, you know, in a vacuum, kind of outside of a specific instance like that, how would you advise President Biden kind of talk to 
you know, black voter demo as, as we look ahead to, to November? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, well, <laughs> advise would be a strong word, but I would, do, but I would certainly point out. You don't want right? to be an advisor? You don't want to, do you don't want to do some pro bono advising? And, you never know. The- you might get summoned. <laughs> you might get summoned to the White House. You never know. Let me see. Phone, mm, not ringing. <laughs> but what I would point out, you know, in case he is also a listener of the Bulwark when he is not watching Morning Joe, he, uh, he, he is somebody who, you know, has enjoyed popularity uh, with black voters, uh, definitely credits them for his 2020 victory. Um, you know, but in talk, you know, I, I think, you know, acknowledging really being honest about the reality that, that there is some stuff that, that, that black voters wanted to see happen from this administration that didn't happen, uh, this cycle. And, and, um, so acknowledging that that didn't happen, saying that this is something that is, that is still a priority to him, uh, you know, that he does still want to try to accomplish in a second term. I think that matters. Continuing to kind of be out there talking to folks on the ground about, uh, you know, what he sees as, as his highlight, you know, as, as his accomplishments uh, for folks, including for, for black Americans, like they need, they, they need to feel like they are part of this agenda. They need to feel, you know, like any constituency, uh, like, like uh, this is a president who sees them, who understands, uh, you know what it is that that they are going through, and 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 that they are somebody uh, that they are a group. You know that that he is working to, um, you know, working to 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 serve as you know when he is governing. So, um, you know, I think you're going to see that. He, I mean, he's his State of the Union is Thursday. It is on the anniversary of Bloody Sunday. I can't imagine that he's not going to address you know issues of race, uh, 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 particularly around voting. Uh, on on Thursday, you know what, what you know, but what is what does he say? Uh, what what is that message to folks? And then you know, immediately coming out of State of the Union, he's going to Pennsylvania and and Georgia, Atlanta and Philadelphia, right? I mean, so clearly, uh, you know, he he understands that these are places uh, and spaces where he needs to be, and that these are folks that he needs to be talking to, uh, you know, and 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 taking on. Uh, but but they 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 need a, a better message around this again because. Um, it galvanizes folks. But what I will say on the other side, you know, you got, um, you know, the former president with these gold sneakers and, you know, kind of trying to establish this kinship uh, you're around impressed. Crimin- you're impre- you're criminality. You're impressed by that move? You know, did you, the, did you the get, mug did you shot. Get a pair? Did you get a pair? The mug shot and the sneakers. That's what black people like, right? Mug shots and sneakers. You, you think that was pretty good? Because messaging? of their shared alleged criminality, I, I guess. Uh, yeah, that, that is that is not a message that is going to appeal to black voters and, in fact, may end up galvanizing some black voters to, to come out and vote against him. You mentioned as as they I want to get to the Philly and Atlanta of it all since that's that that's your turf. But um, have you uh, you mentioned that the state of the union is on the anniversary of Bloody Sunday uh, when the, uh, the demonstrators were beaten by officers on the Edmund Pettus Bridge? I, I, have they previewed that they're going to talk about that? On, on, I, had, I, I had that I hadn't crossed my mind. I have not seen that, but I mean, the vice president was literally in Selma on Sunday right. uh, when they, when they had the uh, observance of, of the anniversary and and was continuing to kind of make. Uh, the case around this election being about rights and being about democracy and 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 really our uh, duty and responsibility as Americans to uh, to really fight for democracy as as those people did uh, on on the bridge that day like that uh, you know making that connection in this moment uh, felt hugely important and then also obviously the headline coming out of Selma was that she, uh, you know, tied this freedom struggle to, to the situation in Gaza, you know, really yeah. making kind of some of the administration's strongest remarks yet around um, uh, uh, around uh, the Palestinian humanitarian crisis uh, and, and calling for a ceasefire, right? I mean, I, I don't think that happens without pressure from, um, you know, activists, including, um, you know, black folks who are concerned about the situation there. Um. I want to get back to the vice president in one second, but but uh, you know, you, as you said, after the State of the Union, um, he's going to head. Biden's going to head down to Atlanta and Philly. Uh, you're from Atlanta. You're in Philly now. You reported in Atlanta. I, do, let's do a little handicapping. Let's just do a little rank politics here for a second. Like, how, what what is your feeling? You know, when you talk to folks on the ground in both Georgia and Pennsylvania, I, I you know, I don't have a ton of 
you know, data to back this up. There's some public data, but Georgia is just is definitely feeling shakier to me uh, than Pennsylvania as far as potentially having a little bit of a snapback element. Um, how, how do you kind of assess those two states? Yeah, I mean, well, Governor Kemp is not an unpopular governor there, right? Right. I mean, this and Shapiro is also- isn't, and this could be as simple as that, right? Yeah. Shapiro is a Democratic governor of Pennsylvania. Kemp's a Republican in Georgia. Yeah, and and this is somebody who, you know, even Democrats remember as giving them, um, you know, stimulus checks in the pandemic, right? So um, they, they they think about that. Maybe they didn't vote for him, but, but they at least, you know, don't necessarily uh, feel like he is a bad person, you know what I mean? Uh, also, you know, the January 6th of it all and him, you know, not finding those 12,000 votes, you know, 12,000 votes down there. Uh, for the former president, um, that is something that also kind of resonates with a lot of people. So Georgia's going to be interesting this year. I mean, for Democrats' part, you know, you do have Democrats that were proud of what they were able to do in Georgia in 2020, you know, not only electing, um, you know, President Biden and Vice President Harris, but also, you know, sending two historic senators, you know, to Georgia uh, in that runoff. Uh, And so, you know, is but is there the enthusiasm to to kind of replicate that uh, again in 2024? I mean, I think that's why you're seeing these folks down there repeatedly and and, and working so much earlier to kind of shore those folks up because you know Georgia is not a done deal as a, as a purple state by any means. You know, I I certainly would not say that just based on what happened in 2020. Yeah, I mean, Georgia, I think always there's this like need in the pundit class for people to try to do an either or on this question of like oh it was it was it persuasion of former republicans in georgia or was it stacy abrams and activism of turnout and it's like both it was both you they needed every coalition fucking there vote. too yeah yeah you needed every vote i mean you know uh, you don't win a state like georgia that went in huge margins to Mitt Romney by not winning any Mitt Romney voters. And you you also don't win the state by not, by not maximizing the base turnout. And and I, yeah, I do think that both with Kemp and with some of what they're seeing with the softness of Biden's base this time, that that's kind of that combination worries me about Georgia. You know, him him going to Philadelphia and Atlanta, you know, kind of straight out of uh, state of the union, I think that is a sign. I mean, and I mean, and why not? We've got it all right. I mean, unions in Philadelphia, you got black voters in Philly and Atlanta, you got suburban women, uh, you know, that, 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 that he's all young voters, all the groups that he's needing to shore up are, are in places like that. And so, um, you know, the messages that he delivers there and also, you know, the messages that he receives there, I think are going to, going to matter and help to shape this race. I want to go back to the vice president for a second. I think, am I right? You were the first person to interview her after she was uh, put on the ticket with Biden. That is, so, that is correct. Okay, so you go back um, with Kamala. I don't, you know, I, I feel like I ask the same question to people, to everyone about Kamala, because it's like the only question that matters, and I, I want to know different people's opinions. I, I don't, I, I don't know her personally. I haven't, I haven't known her personally, but I have a lot of friends who have. And you know she's in she's in California, so I know a lot of people that have seen her you know work behind the scenes. And she you know she's not dumb, and she didn't get the, to the vice presidency by be, you know by being dumb. I mean she is do, does the work, is is intelligent, is passionate. People that work for her like her, and yet like uh, her public persona, like the PR side of it, uh, there's there's just this gap. And, you know, and, and to me, I assess it as I look at her and I'm like, I, I think that maybe she's in her own head a little bit, like like a baseball player that has the yips kind of. And, and you kind of see the her brain. She doesn't want to make a mistake. So she's in her brain a little bit when she's doing these interviews. And I know when she was saying, giving the Hamas answer this weekend, she's talking about how, you know, Hamas has to. What was it? Hamas has to needs to do its thing. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> so like, look, I make I I have word salad all the time, right? But I, you know, I, I think that for some reason, it, rather than just letting it rip, she's in her head a little bit. At least that's my assessment from a distance. I'm wondering as somebody who's like who has interviewed her, who's had FaceTime, like what to you explains kind of this gap between her ability and her persona. Yeah, I mean, letting it rip. I mean, I don't know how many vice presidents I've seen do that who were not named Joe Biden, to be honest with you. I mean, like Mike Pence wasn't letting it rip. 
So no. uh, you Dan know, Quayle wasn't the, letting it rip. No, I mean, I think I think first of all, I, first I think you know I think we acknowledge that there is we are paying more attention to this vice president because of the historic role that she is For sure. occupying, but she is still a she's a non traditional person in a traditional role. Right. The vice president's job is to back up the president. So like this is not somebody who is going to be getting out in front of the president. This is not somebody who has equal footing with the president. Uh, this is somebody who just happened, who, who, who is also the f- first person who looks like her to be doing this job. And so we care a lot more about what it is that she is doing and how she is doing it. And frankly, I mean, we have to be honest about the fact that, you know, uh, given the concerns about the president's age, like this is somebody who we care about because we may have to care about them a lot more. Right. You know? Uh, and so, 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 so there's that. Um, but, but here's what I will say, you know, if we get in the way back machine to 2020, uh, I think that, uh, you know, then vice presidential nominee Kamala Harris was absolutely helpful uh, to this ticket in terms of raising money in terms of galvanizing people, especially black voters, uh, to turn out for, for, you know, for, for this ticket, um, in 2020, but the voter enthusiasm part of it all. Right. Um, I think that you're going to see her doing a lot of the heavy lifting headed into this year. I mean, again, the president of the United States is, is four years older than he was, <laughs> you know, the last time he was running. He's a so day older every day we wake every, up, you know, every day. So that means What does that mean? That means she's on the she's hitting the campaign trail pretty hard. I mean, the same days that he's hitting Philly and Atlanta, I think she's she's doing uh, Phoenix and then she's going to Vegas. So Arizona and Nevada, also two two crucial states like she is, uh, you know, I I think going to be going to be a significant factor, I would say, in whether or not they are able to pull this off. But I I would be really curious to know. how much credit she gets for that versus how much blame she gets if they don't win in November. Yeah. Um, I do have to fact check you on one thing. I, th- I do think Dick Cheney was letting it rip. Maybe not in a, he maybe was not in abs- a great way. He was letting it rip. That's true. <laughs> maybe, maybe not in a construct, maybe not in the way that we want a vice president to let it rip, but he was letting it rip. Um, yeah. I, the, the credit and blame element. I, I just, I mean, I don't know what do you, do you feel like there, the, the, president's team is is stifling her do you think we need to see more of her do you think it's different situations do you think it's like this is just a thankless job and because of the nature of the vice presidency and the fact that she's a black woman and all these things kind of combining make it almost impossible to you know uh have better pr outcomes i don't know like what what how would you assess that i mean yes but also (laughs) you know how how are we covering her you know like i mean as a media you know to say you know when when we hear voters saying you know where is she what is she doing we know where she is and what she's doing we get a message in our inbox every day saying where she is and where she is going we are making choices about whether or not to cover those things uh if voters are saying they do not know her what is our responsibility to be introducing her to these people vis-a-vis you know actually seeing her doing the job um, but but again, that is not something that we traditionally uh, think about when we think about a vice president. Like like we we, we I I just don't know how um, familiar people felt with like I said a Mike Pence or or the you know forty four other uh, white men who had the job before she had it. How how well did we feel like we knew those people? Uh, you know, questions of their likability were not really a thing, uh, and so. This kind of moving target now that we have um, somebody who looks different doing this job, uh, I I think that also says a lot about our political imagination as a country as well as who she is as a politician. Yeah, I think both are happening. And the vice presidency has just kind of been a wasteland for people for a while now. I mean, Mike Pence didn't even make it to Iowa. Uh, George H.W. Bush, the last one to actually become president. Dan Quayle tried to run for president, failed. Um, I guess, uh, I guess Biden, um, you know, th- then didn't come become president immediately after like H.W. did, but he he does um, eventually. Right. So, uh, you know, but not after getting passed over. So it, it, it's it's a tough role either way. I want to get your take on something else that's out there in the chattering class and politics before I want to do a little. I want to do a little girls basketball talk with you, but um, the. Uh, Josh Barrow wrote about this. Um, Sonia Sotomayor uh, has had some health issues. 
Um, we are, you know, now staring down the barrel of, uh, let's just be honest. There's a chance that Donald Trump's president again. I don't, I don't like to think about it either, but there's a chance that he's the president again. And, um, we, you know, saw the just horrible, um, tragedy and timing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death, um, you know, at the end of the, at the end of 2020. And so the question is, should Sonia Sotomayor step aside just because the stakes are so high and give President Biden an opportunity to ensure that he could replace her with a judge that would, you know, defend women's reproductive rights, et cetera, defend, demo, you know, voting rights, et cetera, et cetera. Where, where, where do you kind of fall on that question? I think as, as especially as, as the Supreme Court is coming in more into focus for Democrats and Democratic voters, right, who are understanding elections have consequences. And yeah. the Supreme Court is definitely a, a, a consequence of, um, you know, the 2016 election. Uh, you know, it is a question. Um, and, and the Ruth Bader Ginsburg of it all is, um, you know, hanging over Sonia Sotomayor. Uh, you didn't see folks... Uh, looking to push Clarence Thomas out when, you know, Donald Trump was on, you know, step aside so we can get a younger version of, yeah. of you. And it didn't, didn't happen. Right. So, I mean, you know, a lot of this is, 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 uh, and I actually talked about this on, on, uh, my most, uh, recent podcast episode. A lot of this is 2024 fanfic, right? We are wishing for the Supreme court. We wish we had, we are wishing for the election that we wish we, we are where we are. Right. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, I think, um, this is a conversation that's going to happen because, you know, it, it is kind of part of our, uh, collective hand wringing as a democracy, what to do about the Supreme court. Right. Um, and so, you know, should, should that pressure necessarily fall on, on this one justice to, to step aside so that, so that Joe Biden can kind of make a, a generational, uh, uh, imprint on on the court of, of his own you know i don't know that's again not for me to say i don't get to nominate supreme court justices <laughs> or, or or push them into retirement but um but but yeah it, it, right now a, a lot of that kind of chatter is feeling like fanfic much like you know will will you know will joe biden dump you know t- throw K- kamala harris over over yeah. the side well not if he wants to win black women in november so what yeah. are we talking about yeah, it's also tough for an 81 year old president who's running for re-election to uh, to look at Sonia Sotomayor and be like, "Ooh, sorry, girl, um, you're a little too you're, you know, too you're getting old. out there. It's time for you to step aside." Yeah, it's tough. I don't know the the fan, it is fanfic, but it's also I think there's a practical if you're just able to kind of remove all of the personal elements, all of the identity elements, which you can't, you know. But if you're able to, you look at it and say, "Okay." Well, ensuring we get a younger person in there on the court, ensuring that we're having a Supreme Court fight in the fall where hope folks are talking about uh, or making sure that these issues are in the news. I, I can see how it's a, it would be a benefit to Democrats. Um, I'm not over here pushing Sonia Sotomayor out the door either, but uh, I could see how it would just as a practical matter be be a benefit. Yeah. Um, you've got, uh, you got a big interview on Friday. Uh, you're interviewing Meghan Markle. I've got one. I, I'm. I, I've got to say. I know this is gonna. Any side you take on this, you're gonna offend some people. I'm Team Meghan. I'm Meghan and Harry. I've been with Harry since the ju- from the jump. Oh um, wow. But I do have to say. Oh, I do have to say though. I'm a little. I've one. I've one complaint with them. Okay. About the whole system. Um. You know. I think they're treated shabbily. I do not like the monarchy. Screw all the royals. Don't care. I'm happy with all the moves they've made. But if you're gonna move to California. And just and and give the double bird to the royals. Do we have to call you the Duchess of Sussex still? I don't know. I feel like we should be able to call you Meghan now, or and Harry. I feel like I should be able to call him Harry now because you've made a choice. So that would be my one one beef with them. I don't know. I don't know. As you've as you've done prep on that, I, I guess that's probably not going to be an option for you to just just call her Megs. Unfortunately, definitely not an option. I will register your complaint, though, uh, you. You know, and, and, and see you. and see where that goes. I mean, you know, uh, something to consider. Yeah, I, I, I definitely will, will will make your make your concerns known. Also, RIP to your mentions as well now because you have brought up uh, you have brought up the Duchess. Yeah, were you not Team Harry? It seemed like you were you were gonna interrupt me there. Were you? Mm-mm, no, no, not at all, not at all. I, I, I. Uh, 
was just thinking about your mentions as you were you were sitting <laughs> okay. there talking about that. So. Okay, yeah, you got to pick a side. I feel like I feel like everybody's got to pick a side on this one. Speaking of things, got to pick a side on. Before I lose you, um, so I've been noticing on your social media feed a lot of Dawn Staley content. Uh, the coach of the South Carolina women's basketball team, probably the, the undefeated, best team in the country. Undefeated yeah. South Carolina. Probably the best team in the country. In the Where I took my daughter to go see the ninth-ranked LSU Tigers ladies basketball team defending national champions and Angel sure. Reese. Uh, we saw them on Saturday. We got Caitlin Clark out there, all-time leading scorer, Incredible. making news. We got Mar- So what, can, can you explain to me the, the Don? Are you, are you and Don just pals, or, or is there something else happening there? And kind of how do you assess – the, the tournament is is it is it is it payback time for South Carolina or the Cox gonna gonna take this one or Caitlin I Clark? Mean, what do you how do you handicap it? I I mean they certainly look like they're on their way to championship number three. Good. But I mean, can we just have a moment for women's college basketball Let's though? I mean, it. I I will tell you, I have followed this season more closely. It, it's it's almost bracket time. I, I know a lot of y'all know it's time to fill out the brackets. I don't know what. I'm doing for my men's bracket because I've barely watched any men's games this year. I watched yeah. all women's basketball this year and I was so, ex- it was so, so, so good. I mean, everybody watches women's sports. Like we just need to say it. And uh, I love that you got to go to that game. Uh, I got to see Don Staley uh, and uh, Notre Dame's team play in Paris uh, oh, back in fun. November. It was incredible. I mean, like the energy around, this game right now, I, I, I'm just loving it. Uh, my Dawn Staley fandom, she is a proud uh, West Philadelphian uh, I, with Philadelphia as my adopted city. Um, you know, I certainly root for her. But even before that, I mean, this goes back to the dream team for me, for her. I mean, she's just just ha- has had such an incredible career. This woman is a winner. She's a champion. And we love to see it. And, um, you know, we just the, the whole team is just they're amazing. You, you you wound me up now, and and I I mean March Madness cannot the the, the other the other March Madness cannot come soon enough uh, for me. So I'm ready. I'm I ready. like Don Staley's vibe. I have to admit, I do like her vibe a lot. I, I will you know I will be rooting against her, and hopefully we'll see another another surprise defeat like last mm. year to the LSU Tigers. But uh, I, how I many tell how you. many of those Kim Mulkey sweaters do you have? By the way, do you do, are you rocking? Some of the Kim Mulkey. I, so, Are you down so with my the husband kind of has Kim Mulkey's haircut, and I was oh. pushing very hard for Halloween for <laughs> Toulouse to be a tiger and yeah. for my husband to be Kim Mulkey, oh my you know, God. and for me to be a different LSU themed character. But he 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 wouldn't do it. So maybe next year. There's I, always I can, next year. There's always next year for Halloween. So I, I think that he's a better fit for her vibe. But she's got a lot of great outfits, and I do I get to say just on the merits, and obviously the the women's sports element is great and it's been i was a big agitator for paying the college athletes yes and and, I, and you get a lot of pushback on that and say oh it's been ruined the sports been ruined it has been such a boon to women's sports because now you got these 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 players that can stay caitlin clark and angel reese they can now stay so you get to have a relationship not just with the coaches yes. but the players and they a they get the compensation that they deserve. Hello, free market capitalism. Hello. But also they get to hang out, they get to stay around. And so you can kind of build the, you know, the fandom yes. builds. And I just think it's been awesome for women's college basketball. And I think that this is just kind of the start. Agree. And you love to see these coaches really advocating for, uh, for these young women to get those deals. Right. And, 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 yeah. and uh, you know, we're coming up on equal payday. Like this, it, it matters. It matters. Yeah, get that check. All right. Aaron Haynes, thank you so much for hanging out. Let's do it again soon.